and a warm welcome. You're joining us here at Hyde Park on Other Therana 24. We've been talking about the 78th budget, the 2024 budget, the President's budget speech that was presented uh, recently as well as how the taxes are going to play going forward, how that's really going to affect the corporates to the common man in Sri Lanka. To discuss all this, I think I've got together an eminent panel, an expert panel on the subject. Let me introduce to you uh, the panel that will be discussing taxes, how it affects the um, corporates to the common man tonight at Hyde Park. Uh, let me very warmly welcome Mr. Duminda Hulangamo, Chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, we also have Mr. N. R. Gajendran, Senior Partner at Gajma and Company. A warm welcome to you too. Thank you. Um, as well as Mr. Suresh Pereira, Partner Tax and Regulatory at KPMG. A very warm welcome to you too. Uh, to, to start off the conversation, I'd like to first forget about taxes though and maybe uh, get your opinion on really the budget and how it sets the path going forward to a short to medium term uh, medium term rather medium term policy stability that will take us to our long term goals i'll start off with uh, mr kulangamo yeah, yeah indeed thank you very much uh, first for inviting me to uh, talk to you in this program uh, to answer your question if you look at the budget 2024 uh, was presented as a continuation of the uh, macroeconomic stability framework that was brought in by the beginning of this year. Uh, that's, that is our opinion. Uh, because if you see the macro stability required certain reforms to be carried out, especially on the monetary policy and fiscal policy tightening. Uh, on the fiscal policy, uh, taxes all increased, as you know, over the last uh, one year or so. Uh, the government expenditure uh, reduction cannot happen overnight, but we have seen there is a, uh, not an increase in the recurrent expenditure. Uh, and there is uh, less room for borrowing. Uh, so earlier what happened in the budgets was that we uh, prepared the expenditure and the revenue and the shortfall was met by printing currency or borrowing money from the market. So this time also there's a deficit, all right. But uh, if you take the uh, budget in terms of the expenditure side, uh, there has to be a, there has been increase announced for the private public sector salary increase, and also the increase in the Aswasmo program. Uh, but how we look at it is that has been matched by the increase of VAT. Mm -hmm. So the whole rationale, if you look at, if you heard the president's speech of the budget, is that we have to manage our own affairs, we have to live within our means, we have to live within our income. So, so we look at the increase in VAT of 3%, which are done before the budget, of course, but the income is taken next year. It will be large to finance the increase, increase in social welfare that the government uh, announced in the budget. So there is no other than those two increases, there is no other welfare programs, there is no other reductions that have been proposed. There are no subsidies that have been proposed other than those two. Uh, and then the rates of tax cannot come down. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, what has happened is the macroeconomic stability program that has started has been continuing to the uh, next year. Uh, and I think the stabilization program will continue. Of course, it will have its own costs uh, in the sense that uh, because of the increase of taxes, both income tax and VAT, uh, there is a room for economic growth uh, in an environment where we have uh, a debt default. So because of that, the, until the debt sustainability is certified uh, by the IMF as a dispatchable country, we will not be able to attract FDIs into the country. Uh, we might not be able to attract uh, foreign uh, loans to back to the country. So we need to first get the, the biggest elephant we see in the room is the debt restructuring. Once that is done, uh, we feel but by early part next year should be done based on information you have received. And if that happens, then we can first start the bilateral project that got stalled over the last one and a half years. The Bandar Nagar Airport project, the Cotton Nagar Expressway projects, those things that got stalled, we can start again. And that I believe will bring a lot of uh, staff money into the system mm -hmm. uh, to give a uh, uplift to the uh, 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 domestic economy, especially the contract construction contractor, the sand supplier, I'm going to the lowest levels, the tipper drivers, the sand suppliers, the quarry suppliers, cement, hardware, 
labor, all that will get regenerated if that happens. Uh, so, but of, unfortunately, there can't be a consumption drive as a result because the domestic, uh, what you call the rates of income tax on VAT are high, and in that environment, there will be a big increase in domestic consumption. As a result, there cannot be a big growth in that area. Right. But that stabilization is necessary if we are to achieve any growth in the next 25, 26, 27 for us to grow, we need to first stabilize. So that either foundation has been laid mm -hmm. in the budget, we don't see as extravagant, anything that is given free, and as a discipline shown in the fiscal side and the monetary policy side. So we feel therefore the economy will stabilize. Once it stabilizes, once we the foundation is strong, our economy will grow is our view. Uh, Mr. Tajendra, do you think, uh, do you, do you uh, subscribe to the same um, thought process here that the foundation has been laid, but there is not much room for growth at this current juncture? Thank you, Indivari. Now, if I have a sort of a high level view on the budget, mm. basically the government is committed to stick with the IMF program. There is no question of moving away from that, in spite of the fact uh, uh, that next year is going to be an election year. Uh, that's a firm stand on the government, uh, which we have been, uh, we have derailed the program on seven occasions, and we have gone into difficulty. So that's certainly a positive sign. And also at the same time, the government has been smart enough to give uh, some relief, not from the tax point of view, uh, basically recognizing their land rights, lands are going to be given. There is uh, recognition on uh, uh, house ownership rights, shareholdership rights, and uh, basically even if you see uh, the rents, the pay on government housing has been waived, and also salaries also have been, not salaries, the allowance has been increased by 10,000 rupees. So there is room for people to be uh, comforted and to be satisfied. Now, looking at the numbers of the budget, now if you see, uh, we are expecting a 3% increase, it's going to happen in VAT. Then that increase in the revenue expected on goods and services mm -hmm. compared to 23, uh, 2020 to 24 is about 860 billion rupees. This 4.1 trillion is made up of 860 billion increase in taxes on goods and services. Basically the increase is coming, uh, expected increase is coming from uh, the VAT of 3% increase. Now, whether it is attainable, now if you see in 23, the revenue, what was originally projected was 3.6 uh, trillion. It was uh, recasted at 3.4, and we will end up at 2.7 or 2.8. Uh, so here, we have to hit the numbers. You already, we have our deficit is at about 9%, close to 10%, the budget deficit. So if you don't hit that number, we are going to have a problem. So whether implementation on the revenue side, it's particularly going to be tough because businesses are down, we are on, uh, consumption is down, contraction is on, uh, we are on a debt uh, default environment. Look at the expenditure. Expenditure almost from 5.4 trillion is going up to 7 trillion. If you see as a percentage of the GDP, the total expenditure is expected to grow by 3.5% uh, more than that of uh, uh, 2023. So definitely there will be strain on the fiscal side, you know. And we, we, we are going into a new environment altogether where the central bank of the new central bank pact, uh, there will be no uh, opportunity for the central bank to either directly or indirectly to subscribe to government debt. And if that is not happening, that means basically there is no money printing permitted under the new act. Uh, and if you, oh, so this deficit, if you are going to get financed by, uh, you can't finance it by money printing, which is a good sign, then you have to go to the people uh, to uh, raise the shortfall that we are going to get. If you don't hit the revenue numbers, even already we have a shortfall, we had to raise about 7.35 billion in debt mm -hmm. uh, for the whole year of 2024, which is almost 50% more than 23, which is about 5 trillion. So uh, the uh, to achieve the expected thing, it's going to be a tall order. It's not going to be easy, and uh, there must be accountability in the budgetary process, because if you see in the past, none of these numbers have been achieved, and there has been no accountability. And so and the pro question here is the implementation, both on the revenue and the expenditure, particularly on the expenditure. 
Don't forget we are in a default state. We are a bankrupt country, but we are still wanting to spend. Uh, maybe through the increase in uh, interest rate is about 500 billion because the interest is 500 billion. Increase in salaries is about 200 billion. Still, you can't spend like this uh, and expect uh, revenues which are not going to hit your uh, uh, bank. Uh, Mr. Suresh Pereira, um, with, uh, to add to uh, these comments as well, I'd like to ask you whether this will also address the question of uh, governance and accountability that we've been talking about over the, uh, over the last many years. Well, with regard to the governance aspect, uh, I will start this from the pre uh, previous year's budget. Because in the previous year's budget, there was a reference to a tax ombudsman with regard mm -hmm. to the tax governance aspect of it. And before that, in 2017 also, there was a reference to, uh, sorry, previously budget, there was a reference to the uh, establishment of a presidential taxation commission also. Uh, that is also, in, I'm talking of the tax governance, I'm keeping to that. Right? And uh, in 2017 also, there was a reference to these two institutions. But unfortunately, both, inst both institutions have not been established so as with regard to the tax governance here. So with regard to the governance of the country here, mm, I don't see much basically, but uh, again there is a reference with regard to establishment of a new revenue authority, again with regard to the uh, fiscal uh, governance, mm, with regard to the peace, law and order, etc. Uh, I don't see much references, but of course there is a reference with regard to increasing the uh, payout or the allowances to be given to the uh, police, the forces. Overall, your thoughts on uh, the, the... Yeah, so actually this is my 24th budget, I think, uh, from the time I just entered into the practice. Mm -hmm. So it, this is unique, actually. Uh, when I look at the budget document, the preamble is beautifully written. It refers to this uh, famous Samajivi Katha. And uh, of course, the last uh, part of the budget also, the Annex 4, somebody referred to it as a uh, essay <laughs> written, but uh, it all talks about a vision, I would say. So whether it is practical, or then somebody referred to this as okay, a fair retail also. So whether these are attainable things that are there, for instance, okay, there is a reference to establishment of the universities. But when you look at the analyze the document, you don't see there is a allocation of funds for these uh, universities. And of course, then we look at the, I think, as much that we are not been discussing about this budget, there is a reference to infrastructure development also, for instance, the central highway, there is a reference to establishment of uh, investment zones, etc. So there are so many, uh, wish list that is uh, set out here. Whether this will be achieved, it, this, is what, uh, this is something that we have to keep our fingers crossed uh, here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, I would also like to ask Mr. Dominda Hulangamo, there have been a lot of questions about how much the corporate are tax taxed, whether the corporates are taxed enough, or whether there is room to improve on how you uh, improve the government's tax revenue through some of the richest, co richest uh, corporates in the country. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Has has this uh, uh, the taxing that the system really covered everyone equitably? Uh, <coughs> in the very uh, with regard to the corporate sector, uh, I think it is the corporate sector I refer to largely the public listed companies, the banks, and uh, most of the companies, the multinational companies that are operating here. If that is the corporate sector you're referring to, I think that corporate sector is only sector that is paying tax correctly. Uh, as for the rate, I think 30% is a fairly uh, uh, substantial rate compared to where we were, but comparable with the region. Uh, so I don't think the corporate tax rate is too high or too low. I think 30% is what the average rate. But with regard to the collection, is there's an issue. I think if you take the total tax collection of this country, about 96% comes on on-return taxes. That is what people declare self and pay. Only about 4% comes from additional assessments the department raises through investigations, through interpretation of law, uh, through their audits, etc. So 96% is on return, which means what people self declare. So if you look at that, 96% largely comes from the corporate sector in the form of VAT, in the form of corporate income tax, in the form of customs. I think the compliance levels there are very high. Mm -hmm. If there are assessments in those companies because of interpretation of legal issues. The real, so th then where do we collect it from is the question I think you're asking. Uh, we have budgeted four trillion. Uh, will the four trillion come entirely from the current set or will additional files be open? Now I really don't know how much is out there that is not collected. I really can't give you a figure of that. 
But if you take the VAT uh, threshold and you brought down to 80 million now and going down further, uh, then it can be much bigger than what it is. Uh, because VAT is taxed at the import point, so all the people who import, uh, the records are available with the customs and the department. So they should know how much their sales are, how much their imports are. And even if they import through uh, unauthorized means, if there's a bank remittance, if there's money, if the goods come to customs, then there is a custom declaration made. Then who are the people who are not paying tax is the question, mm. right? So I think the Department of Inland Revenue should first be digitized. Without a digitization system, uh, it is digitized all right, but the current system does not permit to capture all the transactions that are happening. So there has to be a, uh, for example, I always say at every forum here at your big focus, everything, every day is that the two biggest, say on the individual side, the two biggest purchasers are the car and the how land and the house. So those are the two biggest items people spend on. Others are not very significant. But you can always check the RMU records and the land register records, which are coming to the department on a regular basis as to who bought land, who bought cars, and how we finance these things are easy questions for them to ask. There is a process, but it's not happening very robustly. Uh, there is, it's done on a, on a sample basis. But if it is a digitized system, then no one can erase records and it can be an automatic process. It's not happening. Uh, but the corporate sector, I think, in my view, if you take, if you take even this time, the banking sector pays about almost 60% of their income as taxes. Uh, corporate sector pays 30% income tax and 15% dividend tax, about 45%. So I think the corporate sector is properly taxed. In fact, it's too high, but we can't afford to drop it now. But what they have to do is try to see how you can enhance and increase in it. But having said that in there, I don't know how much is the outside to tax further. Whether it's one trillion or two trillion, I don't know. Uh, so that is something the revenue administration has to be strengthened in order to make sure the people do comply and pay. So unfortunately, Sri Lanka, you can't blame only the revenue authorities. You have to blame the people and the corporate sector also. Now the department has to go to the extent of, for example, writing letters to private schools and asking names of parents uh, who send their children to private schools to check their tax files. They have to go and check the records of uh, five-star hotels to see uh, who has used the banquet hall for weddings and receptions to check that they have paid tax. So I mean, they had to go to that level because of the people also don't comply. So you can't, it's always two hands, you need two hands to clap. Then also in terms of corruption and governance, there is, but both parties are involved. Mm. So I think the responsibility lies not only with the revenue, I don't think you need to wait for revenue to go and catch these people, put them into a truck and bring them and ask them to pay. A compliance must come naturally as well as a civic conscious society, as a public. Because Sri Lankans are very good at criticizing others, but not at themselves. So I think we need to look at inward and see, okay, are we doing it correctly? Are we civic conscious? Are we paying the tax correctly? It's something that people also must do on their own and not wait for the regulator to come and say, Chum, you're doing it wrong, pay. Is this mm -hmm. the answer to you to your question? Did I ask your question? I don't know. Yes, I, 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 think, I think you've definitely set the tone for this conversation as yeah. well. I'd like to ask Mr. Gajendran, taking a cue from uh, Mr. Hulangamu's comments. Uh, now, the introduction of tax identification numbers and uh, asking above 18 year olds to, um, to, to register, to comply. How challenging will this be for Sri Lanka going forward? Especially, we've been talking about Aramis, we've been talking about the controversies surrounding the digitization uh, process, as well as how challenging really the governance uh, structure is. Um, so going forward, this is ambitious, but how can we really move ahead to comply? Uh, before going into the tax identification number in the very, now if you see in the 90s, early 90s, uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s, our tax to GDP was 20, 22%. Now it dropped to about 7%. In 23, we expected it to be about 11% of the um, um, uh, total uh, of the GDP. But we'll end up at 9%. Now, with all the increase in taxes, which is considered over the hill at the moment, and it's considered unbearable from the individual's point of view, we will end up only 9%. We are ending up at 9% or 10%. Only visible increase the next year is this 3% on VAT. 
and maybe that VAT threshold there is talk, nothing in the budget, but there is talk that threshold will be brought down further. So there is a difference of about at least 10% which we were collecting before, but now we are not collecting. Mm. So we have to see, if they have to really study and research and see why it is. Now, as mentioned, there is evasion. Uh, people think uh, there are businesses not paying taxes. There, are peop the, there is a thought that professionals are not paying taxes. Uh, teachers, lawyers, uh, doctors, uh, uh, I don't know if the accountants are included, but generally they don't say about accountants much. <laughs> but they, they, they are saying they are not paying the taxes. So even if you collect all those taxes, can we bridge this 10% deficit, which we have had, we have gone into now? Uh, basically, if you ask me, the difference is because of Humbly put it, it's malfeasance, misfeasance, and non-feasance, and palm greasing. At the highest level, you know, there is so much of money that is being spoken of, which is completely out of the world. We count the grasp or imagination of some of us, right? So it is there the money is. The fish thinks from the head, right? You can't put strictures on Inland Revenue officers, customs officers, excise officers, government servants, unless you set the pace at the top, right? Unless that is put into order, we will not reach these targets. Impossible to reach these targets. Now, in all the enthusiasm, we are, we are going to get taxpayer identification numbers for people over 18 years. I think we must, un the people, public at large must understand you know, there is a difference of asking for a taxpayer identification number if you are liable to tax and to file returns. And also the requirement of a taxpayer identification number now without being liable to uh, tax and have the obligation to file returns. So if you are going to open a TIN number and if you are not liable, you must fill the application properly that, that you don't feel a tax field. So technically, you won't get a return for that purpose. But in practice, it's not going to happen like that. You know, how many people, there are about 15 million people are there over 18 years. Uh, whether all of them are going to go and ask for a TIN number, whether if they are going and asking whether the system can adapt it, the administration is ready for it. What are you going to do if people don't go and Register is the Commissioner General going to impose a fine of fifty thousand rupees? What is provided in the law? So there is a rush to increase the files, and they said it's have been reported this year there is some two hundred thousand increases in tax files. I can remember a few years ago also they, uh, there was a rush on increasing the files, and they had later on they had to close up the file because they went and opened up file for PUI employees and all. Well, basically, if you don't have any other income taxes deducted at source now, you don't need to pay any taxes. So it's a tall order. Mm -hmm. You have to clean up the place from, you know, we, we used to raise 20, 22 uh, percent tax on GDP. Uh, in our, uh, the, the, the GDP for next year is 31.5 trillion. 10 percent is three and a half trillion, three trillion. If it is just five percent is one and a half trillion. Don't you think if we can tap that money, we'll be out of the woods? We can't. We can go behind the uh, professionals. You can go behind the uh, people uh, who are evading taxes. Uh, but I think uh, we are not, uh, we are scratching the surface. We are not going to the root cause for the shortfall of taxes. Mm -hmm. um, ambitious targets again I must mention but uh, Mr. Suresh Perra if you can just take us through uh, the numbers really for the next year as well uh, we have a debt to um, GDP target and as well the budget deficit 9.1 percent of GDP with all that where the revenue is coming into the government from how it is going to be financed uh, especially uh, many believe that it's it is the personal income that is targeted uh, especially with the personal income 
tax uh, that was uh, increased to some 36 percent um, last year with that there seems to be that it's 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 the professionals the individuals that are targeted at least that the, that's the conversation in society um, with that is this really sustainable for an economy uh, and we heard that um, with the, the kind of consumption that is curtailed because of increased taxation uh, whether it's VAT or other kinds of levies um, economic activity will be curtailed so with all this how are we really going to manage the short to mid-term growth for the economy yes no, I think the statement that you made uh, personal tax system has been geared to capture the professionals I don't think that statement is correct because the personal tax system applies to everyone equally there are no uh, there are no special provisions applicable to professionals to professionals now in the past uh, we have seen uh, lenient provisions uh, for the professionals so I don't think uh, there is anything specific detrimental that has been created uh, towards the professionals in the per current personal tax system so coming to the question uh, with regard to the numbers uh, I think uh, last week we saw in the papers uh, Commissioner General is expecting to uh, gather more than 3 billion uh, by way of tax revenue and he says basically that is going to be the highest in the history mm -hmm. and uh, with regard to the tax to GDP ratio yes uh, basically last time it was a 7.3 very low and uh, IMF has given us a target to uh, by 2025 to uh, come to 15% uh, uh, tax to GDP ratio by 2025 right so now how are we going to achieve these uh, targets tax we have to collect taxes correct right now the point is basically where are we going to collect the taxes now for that to answer that question I will ask another question what is the process that we have in Sri Lanka to identify where to collect the taxes from how to design the tax policies you see basically from the point of view of the side of the bench that I am at basically I'm in the person a tax consultant so we say that tax planning is a science uh, uh, tax planning is a science uh, and it's an art at the same time I would say how to design a tax system how to uh, collect the taxes that is the tax administration that is that is also an art that is also uh, is a science now I don't see that uh, art or science uh, at the top in Sri Lanka with regard to the tax uh, policy making as well as tax uh, administration what we have in Sri Lanka is okay at the top there is the finance minister who happens to be the uh, president of the country also so how much time does he have to think about the tax system in Sri Lanka then we have uh, maybe the, from time to time a person from the Indian Revenue Department is seconded to the finance ministry to uh, assist the tax making uh, tax policy making process so other than that we don't do we do not have a particular structure for uh, designing tax uh, policies for overseeing the tax administration so if you don't have that proper structure I would say that you can't expect outcome positive outcome with regard to the policy making good policies as well as the proper administration so I think that is where the uh, lacuna in the Sri Lankan tax system is so now with regard to this there is this famous uh, IMF uh, document how to make a tax policy unit it's uh, available in the IMF website when you see you can see this now that is the kind of a thing that we need to have in Sri Lanka so in order to basically streamline the entire tax process in Sri Lanka that's something I'd like to uh, speak further but when we return after this short break here at Hyde Park on other than a 24 just stay with us Welcome back. You're joining <coughs> us once again at Hyde Park on Other Than a 24, and we're talking about taxes, how it affects corporates to the common man. Um, I'd like to talk to um, Mr. Dumit the Hulangamo again. Uh, there was conversation about how an effective tax policy can be implemented, how you have a unique tax structure for a country. But in designing ours, how do we really make sure that we do not deter foreign direct investments or FDIs into the country? We have granted exemptions previously and then our tax policies, our structures change. There is inconsistent policy. From that to today's uh, scenario how do we really uh, strike a balance in ensuring that we don't deter uh, FDIs regardless of what happens within the country 
Yeah, so in the very in regard to FDI, I think uh, when a person comes or is making a decision or evaluating a country to invest, uh, there will be so many criteria that he or she will go through. Uh, political stability, economic stability of the country, the market size of the country, uh, skilled labor available, access to markets, a whole range of things they go through. And taxation is one aspect. So there is this theory to say that we should not have given exemptions uh, because of the exemptions that we uh, have uh, reduced our tax base. Uh, that's one side of the theory. The other part says, no, we have to give exemptions. Uh, without exemptions, uh, people would come. There's no traction. So I think there are arguments both in favor of both parties. Uh, at a time when Sri Lanka uh, came out of a sort of a, a socialist government, socialist economic policies up to 77, we had to attract the world to Sri Lanka and we had to give incentives. And I think that really paved the way uh, that brought in a lot of foreign investment to the country, the free trade zone concept was set up. Even before most countries in the region started, we started all that. We attracted volumes of investments to the country because the incentives can be offered. Then we had the government quota system, so there are numerous incentives were there. Uh, then, of course, the Board of Investors was set up and they gave exemptions all over. So I think there is a large amount of investment that came because of incentives. You, I can't say there is no investment that came because of incentives not there. Even under the SDP Act, a lot of people have criticized the discretionary part of the SDP Act and SDP should have been there. But I think SDP did bring investments. Uh, whether they wouldn't have come without tax, I don't know, but they did bring in investments. So I don't agree with the theory that relief and exemptions alone won't bring investments, it does. The reason for Sri Lanka is that all the other criteria I told you, mm -hmm. we are standing at the bottom. Uh, when you rank at the bottom in terms of political stability, in terms of consistency of policy, in terms of economic stability, in terms of attraction, market size, all those things, we are not scoring high points. So taxation is probably the only point that we score, and the government has to give tax holidays benefits to attract investments. That is one argument. On the other hand, the theory is that do investments really come because of taxation? Now, exports have been at 14% for a long period of time. Uh, BPO industry has been exempt for a long period of time. But our exports still at $12 billion. If exports were, if, if taxation was incentive exports, and that is the only reason people came, they should have been $50 billion, not $12 billion. So there are arguments both for and against. And yet, each period of time, these things change. Now, current Sri Lanka is not in a position to give incentives for investments. Uh, because of that, we, we cannot give incentives for investments because of our tax, uh, what you call, collection has to be improved. And we are a dead default country because of those reasons our IMF has said we have to increase. So therefore, we are not in a position to give incentives. But these things keep changing. If the country does well, uh, if the economy rebounds, uh, if we have to attract more investments, if our ratios improve, then probably we can. So I don't think there is ever a situation you can say one size fits everything. That we have to follow one particular policy every day of the year. I don't think that's, we have to keep changing depending on circumstance and time. Which way investments are moving, which way countries are moving, uh, which way investments are flowing, we have to keep a track of it and see which ranks priority at a particular given time. So I don't think you can have a set policy saying, okay, this is what the policy we to follow every day in our lives, no. Yeah. I mean, even countries like the UK, even a country like Ireland, they are giving tax concessions to attack investments. So, so there is always, uh, it's a moving game, it's a moving target. We can't say that there's one particular position we have to take. It'll keep moving depending on the economic dynamics of the world and which way it's moving. Um, the, the domestic debt restructuring uh, process, if that is not completed in time or if that drag drags on, will there be an impact on uh, the, the funds like the Employees Provident Fund? What's the impact on that? I'd like to ask Mr. Gajendran. Yes, basically I have a different view uh, on this taxability of the employees provident fund in the very. Uh, under the 1958 uh, EPF Act, section 43 clearly articulates that EPF fund, the investment income, is exempt from tax, income tax, under any, other, any laws. That provision still stands. And also the Inland Revenue Act, the new Act 24 of 2017, Section 9, clearly states that 
recognizes that type of exemptions in the other laws. Now, so if the central bank is the guardian of the EPF fund, wants to give relief to the employees because they are the people, the individuals, as you say, have been severely hit by all forms of tax, and also the employees also, because in their case, tax is deducted at source, no breathing space at the point of payment of their remunerations or salaries. Uh, so if it wants to give relief uh, uh, with all these impositions, they need not upset the uh, IMF program because it has nothing to do with the IMF. We are not giving any new exemptions or reliefs. It is already available, only the position has to be taken. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, uh, now, if you see any the under the bonds, if you don't accept the, de, uh, the domestic restructuring program, the, the bonds with that's going to be, that is issued, the, the rates will go up, tax rates will go up. If you don't go for opted to scale down your rate of interest, uh, the bond coupon rate, tax will go up. Now here again, even if EPF is liable to tax, there is another point of view that uh, the central bank should take into consideration as the guardian is that earlier under uh, the old acts, earlier previous acts, I mean, there's investment income, there was no deduction for expenditure incurred on the investment income. But in the new act, there is expenditure incurred on the investment income, uh, you can get the deduction. So basically, uh, there is a tendency, yeah, or they have been always the tax of the interest income, the EPF has been taxed at the top line. Uh, now there is a possibility you can tax at the bottom line, uh, allowing for expenditure and also interest expenditure, interest that is paid to the credited to the, uh, the balances of the uh, mm -hmm. employees. So uh, there is still opportunity under the existing laws without v modification on vary anything. If you want, the central bank wants, but only thing central bank as the guardian who, uh, who is filing the return for so them has to take that position. Otherwise, Inland Road is not going to come and just give you uh, these things if you don't request for it in your return. So there is uh, room for that, certainly. Right. Uh, Mr. Suresh Pereira, wh what would you add to the question of uh, foreign direct investments as well as uh, the corporate sector being taxed? Um, especially if you've been talking about how the corporates have been running this economy regardless of the uh, <coughs> challenges, the private sector uh, uh, rather have been running this economy regardless of the challenges the country faced. So with all that, how do you think the private sector, the corporates should also brace uh, for or the impacts going forward? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think the qu you asked this question previously from Dubinda also. With regards to corporates, are they paying enough taxes? So like rightly he pointed out, 30% uh, tax rate is a fair tax rate. But where I deviate from that is basically, uh, what we have in Sri Lanka with regards to the corporate now is a uniform tax rate. With the irrespective of the size of the corporate, whether it's a SME or whether it's a large corporate, the tax rate is uh, 40, uh, 30 percent. Whether it is uh, in a preferred industry, an industry that we should uh, encourage, like agriculture uh, or tourism, etc. Basically, also the uh, the rate is basically uniform. Now, this is where I believe from that tax theory point, we need to ha use the tax rate as a tool to incentivize and uh, disincentivize basically the uh, the relevant sector. For instance, I personally believe that uh, with regard to SMEs, there has to be a lower tax rate. With regard to the preferred industries, industries that we should uh, encourage, uh, there has to be a different uh, tax rate. So answering your question whether corporates uh, are contributing uh, enough, that of course is basically uh, the two things. What is the policy aspect of it? Are we having the correct tax policy with regard to the corporates? The other aspect is, I think the window again alluded to this. Uh, from the point of the tax administration, are the right amount of taxes being collected from the corporates? Now, let me elaborate this one. Now, when it comes to uh, corporates also, there are different types of companies. There are different types of industries. Now, in order for an inland revenue officer to collect the correct amount of uh, taxes from a 
complicated industry, he needs to have a knowledge, he, he, he should have the knowledge with regard to the as aspects of that industry. If you don't understand the industry, if you don't understand the economic activities, then the return that is filed with little bit of uh, perusal basically gets through. But if the uh, activities could be analyzed, if the person understands, sometimes the collection could be different. Now this is uh, uh, on the face of statement that I'm saying because uh, the point that I'm uh, uh, emphasizing here is that there should be a proper mechanism for the inland revenue officers also to be competent in specific industries specific economic activities, say the financial services, different logistics, different, so then only that they will be able to uh, carry, to collect the cor correct amount of taxes there. Uh, do you agree to uh, this, uh, Mr. Hulangamo, the comments uh, made by Mr. P Suresh Pereira? He may say, okay, but which one are you referring to? Uh, no, I'm talking about the, uh, the corporates, that, that the way it is being taxed, it has different to be rates, multiple rates. Yes. But it's like this inquiry, I think, if there was a choice, yes, you could have. If you look at the way the tax policy was handled over the last many years, was that we had incentives for certain industries. Some were exempt, some were at lower rates, some were at the higher rates. So that was in a, in a normal, as I told you, under on normal circumstances, normal situation. Uh, but we are not in that situation. Uh, if I just sum it up in brief, I tell you, uh, I am a debtor and I have a creditor. Uh, to whom I have paid my money and I had defaulted my creditor. So the creditor is telling me I'll give you time to pay, I'll restructure your debt, I'll give you time to pay, but only if there is a third party who will certify to me that you have sufficient income minus expenses to pay my debt. So third party comes and tells us yes I'll do that for you, but you have to build my conditions. So at the part of the IMF, I am the data creditor is the both bilateral and private creditor. So in a situation where we have fallen short of our revenue to meet our expenses and to pay off the creditors, the only party who's certifying agree to give a guarantee to us that I will be standing by the creditor and making sure you pay them is IMF. So whether we like it or not, uh, we can't be we cannot flex the rates based on industry. I quite agree with what you're saying. And, uh, under normal circumstances, as a Ceylon Chamber, we have members from different industries, so we would always love uh, priority sectors to be given a different rate. But the situation is such, if you reduce the priority sector to 14%, then the standard has to go to 45%. Because currently we have a four trillion uh, revenue targeted. And if I'm going to make you 15%, the other man has to pay 45% mm -hmm. because our basket is limited. There is no choice for us to vary it. So in that context, under situations, that's why I say growth can get impacted uh, because of uh, these policies we have taken, but we have no choice in the situation because we have to, as I told you first, we have to first stabilize the economy, bring macro fundamentals is correct, balance our revenues of expenditure. Uh, but even if we are even at higher rates of interest, if you take four trillion is the expected revenue, uh, recurrent expenditure on salary is 1.2 trillion and on 1.3 trillion rather targeted. And then another 1.3 goes for pensions and subsidies. Those are not discretionary expenses. They're non-discretionary. You can't put public service on the road next day. You can't cut Samurdi. You can't cut Aswaswa. You can't cut pensions. So, mm -hmm. so all this non-discretionary expenditure we have. And that is a great 2.7 trillion. And an interest of another 2.7 trillion to make. So they are non-discretionary again. So only discretionary expense is capital expenditure. You cut that, you reduce growth. So where do we then collect the tax from? So that's why the government has got a uniform rate. The current situation, there is no way, in I, in, from, from the Chamber's point of view, we have discussed this, argued the IMF, we have met the World Bank, we have met the President, we have taken these cases, and we have heard. So I think at the moment, there is no way that we can cut the rates down to what you are saying. So we, this, is, we, this is the final few minutes of the program, just a minute each for closing remarks. I won't ask you questions, but maybe you can add um, your comments, but also maybe touch on what legal reforms we need going forward and uh, the, the 450 billion rupee state banks recapitalization that was spoken about um, during uh, the budget. Closing remarks, a minute each. I, uh, th that's, I think, uh, all the time we have for uh, airtime tonight. Um, maybe Mr. Gajendran, you can uh, no, go the ahead. This, uh, there has been discussion on how do you give relief to the corporates. Mm -hmm. 
without affecting the growth and economic activity. Exemptions have been, no, it's not the way. It's been, reduced rates may not be the way. But if you see the composition of the GDP, of exports, imports, public expenditure, public uh, demand, and there is one important other factor, investment. Now, there can be expenditure where the businesses as corporates incur, which can boost economic activity if it is in the nature of investments. And in, if that is recognized, you can give some relief for on that expenditures. For example, training, retraining, you know, product development, business development, going green, you know. These though you there is relief given because of the, if the legal expenditure is uh, the, if the tax expenditure is more than the legal expenditure, there can be relief given. And uh, basically, if that path goes, yes, there is a compromise on tax revenue, but it is uh, because if you give other tax relief, there is no way you can say you, it's going to add to your growth and uh, GDP. But here, because you are spending, right, and it is of investment in nature, uh, uh, business development, product development, employee, because you have to keep them now. They're, you know, if, if people are going abroad, so you have to train them. Uh, going green, agro, as you meant, agriculture, you know, uh, you know, agro processing becoming uh, agriculture competitive. Uh, 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 so th those are technology right. selected, those are you can do. Uh, that has to be considered. I mean, this year they couldn't, I think, going forward, that oh. is the way of considering. So that, because do you have to, whatever said and done, we have to entice this, uh, apart from the local investment, the foreign investors. What are you offering? You know, as you said, uh, it was mentioned, they look at GDP growth rate, they look at interest rate, they look at inflation, they look, look at uh, uh, exchange rate. Yeah. They look at the employee, the, uh, the employee sch schemes, what is being implemented, infrastructure, and corporate taxes, and moreover, the political stability and the corruption. If there is, in this country, investment costs more because of corruption. In the case of local investors, uh, naturally they have to save to invest. Whether that environment is there, I can remember my father used to say when we were young, when you earn, first invest, then save. If there's anything left, you spend. So unless we go to those, uh, mm -hmm. we bring that environment in, we are going to have a problem. Mr. Pereira? Yeah, I, use, I will use that uh, one minute again with regard to this, this tax policy of uh, taxation of the corporates. Uh, I have no quarrel with, with regard to the point that we do have to collect the taxes. It's not that I'm taking. To collect that required amount of taxes to meet that uh, relevant tax to GDP ratio, the techniques that we use are the important ones. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm trying to say is basically we are taking the shortcut, just increasing the VAT rate for everyone, uh, even in, when it comes to uh, corporate taxation, we are just looking at one rate. Now, if you look at the budget speech, uh, there is a statement to say that with regard to the personal taxes, the system will not change. I will not elaborate on that one, but I will elaborate. The next point uh, in the budget speech is the corporate uh, taxes is a progressive system, and that progressive system will continue. But actually in Sri Lanka, we don't have a progressive tax system with regard to the uh, corporate taxation rate. What we have is a flat uh, tax, uh, flat rate system. So I don't, un I don't think the policymakers understand what they're saying. In the, in the budget, which they are, it's, it says basically that the progressive taxation of the corporates will continue. That is not what we have. So this is what I'm saying basically we need to have we, this process of tax policy making has to be streamlined. We need to have the correct team designing the uh, designing the tax policies, decide and, and deciding where to collect these uh, taxes to fill this tax gap. Sri Lanka in a crisis situation, we need to collect the taxes. I'm fully with that. But where do you collect these taxes without killing people? That's the important point. When it comes to SMEs uh, in the budget speech itself, it says that big percentage of the SMEs are struggling or basically have closed up. Mm -hmm. So. If, it, if, it, if the policymakers are not opening their eyes and rea realizing what is happening because of their policies, then there's something wrong. Well, you on the on the you asked about the 450 billion rupees uh, yes. allocated for this question yes. you asked, I think. Yes. 
Yeah, so the 450 billion rupees allocated in the very is for the, uh, uh, to me, the capital ratios of the banking system because the uh, IMF uh, and the ADB rather conducted the, uh, for all commercial banks in Sri Lanka, uh, asset quality review to see whether uh, we have made adequate provisions uh, based on international standards against the loan book, which included the ISBs as well as mm -hmm. the local bonds. Uh, so if there's a shortfall, there is a shortfall. And if there is a requirement of capital adequacy, then the 450 billion is actually allocated in respect of meeting the requirement for banking sector. But I thought it was only for the state banks, uh, because state banks will sell 20% of their stake. And with that money, we have the 250 billion rupee income I have seen. They might be partly set off that 450, but principally the 450 is allocated to meet the capital adequacy deficiencies that banks might have if they go for its restructuring. Mm -hmm. But can the government manage its revenue with such a commitment? No, so it won't go. I, I, I mean, there's allocation, but it will be on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. For example, they'll have to first do the first, the once the DDR or the external debt restructuring is announced, you can see what kind of fair cut they're taking. So, based on that, only I think the replacement will come. If there's a hit on the capital adequacy ratios, then there is a provision made for the bank. So, I don't know how much of that will be spent this year. Right. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time here at Hyde Park. Uh, we were discussing taxes, how it affects corporates, the common man, uh, especially with Sri Lanka's targets uh, for 2048 in the long term, but how the medium to short term policies and structures are placed. Thank you very much. We had with us Mr. Duminda Hulangamua, Chairman, Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, Country Managing Partner for Sri Lanka and the Maldives, Ernst & Young. Thank you very much for your time here at Hyde Park. We also had with us Mr. N. R. Gaj Gajendran, a senior tax partner at, or rather senior partner at Gajma and Company. Thank you very much for your expertise as well. Um, we were also talking to Mr. Suresh Pereira, attorney at law and partner tax and regulatory at KPMG. Thank you once again for your contribution. We'll return next week at the same time with yet another discussion at Hyde Park. Thank you for watching. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>